Good morning, and welcome to Foundations of the Faith. I'm Pastor David. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we do indeed thank you for the opportunity to come together in your name and to learn of you, to learn of this great salvation that you have given us. And Lord, we know these things are eternal in consequence, eternal in nature. So please help us to concentrate, help us to understand, help us to live this great word of yours. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. 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 We're talking this morning about faith and repentance. Can you be saved from the fires of hell without faith? No. Can you be saved from the fires of hell without repentance? No. Therefore, if you are correct, faith is the indispensable channel of salvation. It is instrumental. In Hebrews 4, I'm sorry, 11, 6, we are told that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 declares, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. John 3.16 uses the verbal form of the word faith, believe, rather than the noun. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He gave his only son, but only those who believe in him will not perish. Those who don't believe in him will perish. It's important to remember what faith is not. What faith is not. Faith is not merely a feeling. Some people have a testimony where it's all a feeling, that they came to this certain feeling and they knew they had faith. Now, I'm not saying faith is not accompanied by feelings. What I am saying is faith is not merely a feeling. Notice the difference. Faith is not merely wishing something is true. I have faith that God will send me that check next week. <laughs> That's not faith, necessarily. Faith is not merely optimism. Right? Some people are very optimistic. Everything's going to work out great. Don't worry. Every, God's got it. Everything's in good, you know. I'm not saying there's not an aspect of that, but I'm not saying, but I am saying it's not merely optimism. Now, here comes the heresy. Are you ready? Lots of heresy. Has anybody heard of a guy named Norman Vincent Peale? He was a Methodist minister, and he was a heretic. He wrote a best-selling book in 1952 called The Power of Positive Thinking. <coughs> People went crazy. It sold two million copies in the first two years. The Power of Positive Thinking. Five million copies worldwide. 
Now, I think positive thinking is a good thing. I don't want to be Debbie Downer. But Peel was saying something a little more deeply than we would want to go. Peel concluded this, according to your faith in yourself, according to your faith in your job, according to your faith in God, <laughs> this far will you get and no further. Now, it's partially correct, but like a broken clock. A broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's not a broken clock. Faith, my brothers and sisters, has an object. It's faith in Christ. To peel... Faith is really another word for self-confidence, for a largely ungrounded optimism. There's some value in a positive mental attitude. It can help you do your work better, but that's not faith in the biblical sense. That might help you hit the baseball on a little league team, but it's not what the Bible's talking about the faith that is instrumental in salvation. Against these distortions, we must reply that real faith is not all based on an individual's attitudes and feelings. Aren't your feelings unstable? Aren't human definitions of faith unstable? In the context of biblical teaching, Faith is stable, for it is faith in a stable, trustworthy God who reveals himself reliably. What's this? A deed. If that's your house and you live in this nice house, you like the dirt, you plant flowers in it, and grass. Does the dirt have your name on it? Like, does it say Sally Smith? <laughs> you dig in the dirt and it sees Sally Smith on every piece of dirt. Every little piece of dirt, every rock, every board in your house, every two by four, inside the walls, outside, says Sally Smith, Sally Smith. It doesn't say anything. It might say it on the mailbox. But how do you know you have the house? By the deed. The deed says, I, Jim Smith, hereby convey this property to Sally Brown. It's a deed. It's what's called title. That's what lawyers call it. And someone would say, do you have title to this house? I.e., are you the owner of this house? How long, if you own a house, how long does your title last? Until you sell it. Excuse me? Until you sell it. Until you're dead. What if you never sell it? Dead. Until you're dead. Does it? Does it? It doesn't. How could Sally will her house to me? She's dead. It's infinite for as long as the United States shall endure. So that you're titled to your property. That's why you have to give it away through your will or your estate plan. Because you're going to last this long. The dirt's going to last. American dirt will last this long. Somebody else comes in and takes over then. Your deed will probably not mean much. Give me that deed. <laughs> that property's ours now. So why am I talking about deeds? Because faith is the title deed. Get it? Faith says, this is yours. 
When I can read my title clear to mansions in the skies. That's what they were talking about in the hymn, born in the 1700s. Beautiful song. We don't sing it enough. Probably sing it next week now. Anyway, <laughs> although none of us has entered into the fullness of the inheritance that is ours through faith in Christ, right? You haven't received the full measure of your salvation. You have no idea what it's like to be in the actual physical presence of Jesus in heaven with all the saints. You have no idea what that's like. You can only imagine. I can only imagine. Faith is our title deed to it. Faith is itself the evidence of things not yet fully seen. You dig? Yeah. You follow me now. You track it with me. Okay. <laughs> if this were a human title deed, there would be room for doubt. There could be some problem in the chain of title. Maybe there was a forgery. That's why you buy title insurance. But in dealing with God, doubt is unwarranted because of God's nature. He is the God of truth. So whatever he declares, whatever he says, can be trusted. He's infallible. So whatever he de declares can be trusted completely. He's faithful. If he promises something, we know he will do it. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. Nothing can stop him giving you your inheritance. Nothing. Hello? If you save now, you're going to get the whole nine when you go to heaven. And there you are all afraid of death. When you realize that it is the gateway until something you had never dreamed of. Now, I'm not saying you should not take care of yourself, sit around, eat bacon, smoke cigarettes. What I'm saying is y'all get busy for the Lord until he takes you home. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> now, listen. Listen, listen. When God calls us to believe in Christ, he's calling us to do the most sensible thing we could ever do. The world thinks you're nuts. But you're the most sensible people in the world. He's asking us to believe the word of the only being in the universe who is entirely reliable. Will you ever have a better offer? Can you speak to someone who is more reliable? Never. People who say no to God are nuts. That's insane. Consider this. I know this too. <laughs> Who are these people? Yes. And what are they standing in front of? In Maine. How do you get to Maine? The highway. There's a bridge. The bridge goes over a river. It is the border between New Hampshire and Maine. The middle of the river is the border. What's the bridge called? It's green. It's big. It sounds like an Indian name because it is. P I S. C-A. Piscataua, the Piscataua River Bridge. How many of you have gone over the Piscataua River Bridge? I have. Too many to count. Amen. Did you ever stop before you got to the bridge and looked at the bolts to make sure that they were all right? Did you go under the bridge and dangle above the river to see if there were any cracks underneath? Did you check the road? Did you look at the engineering certificates? You just, what? Most people will go through 
What? What? Bridge with faith, knowing that faith. Don't think about it. Oh yeah, they're like, oh, this bridge is gonna. Would you go over the bridge if you didn't have faith? That it wouldn't hold your car up. That you would come tumbling down to the ground, hit the ground on a rock, your head smashed open, and your brains come out, and blood, and you said a few things, you gurgled a few times. And... Um, go to see Jesus. I'm going home, bro. I don't know about you. This is what John is getting at when he writes, if we receive the testimony of men that the bridge is safe, the testimony of God's greater. Amen? Amen. You never question the Piscataway River Bridge. Why would you question God, who is much more reliable than those engineers? John is drawing a contrast between the way in which we trust others, even though they're untrustworthy, in the way we ought to trust God. We trust other human beings every day of our lives. We open up a bottle of something, juice, and drink it, right? We know, we're trusting that there's not poison in it, or there's not a mouse at the bottom of it. <laughs> we have faith that the bridge will hold us up. We have faith in the engineers who designed it. People we don't know. John argues that if we can do this with other human beings who are often untrustworthy, we can do it with God. Indeed, we must. For God commands faith and the salvation of our souls must express itself through his, these responses to his offer. The response is faith. Now, faith has three parts. What's the first part? Come on, you reform people. Believe? No, nope, before we even get to believe. The problem with the evangelical world is they want you to believe before what I'm suggesting. Chosen? Huh? Before you're chosen? No, no, no. After that, after chosen. After Joseph's, before belief, somewhere in there. Faith. Before faith. Okay. Faith is part, this is part. Trust. What? If you walked in here, you didn't know a, you didn't know a lick about Jesus, right? You come into this church, you don't know a lick about Jesus. And I said, now it's time, if you're playing some pretty music, now it's time to put your faith and trust in Jesus. And, and, uh, and it, it, people say, who's Jesus? I, I ain't going to put my oh, faith in... You mean knowledge. What? Knowledge. Say it again. Knowledge. I, I can't hear you. Knowledge. <laughs> knowledge. You got to know something before you believe. What does he say in Romans? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Knowledge of faith. Who's the guy in the long beard? Aaron? <laughs> No, that's John Calvin. He says, we shall possess a right definition of faith if we call it a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence toward us, founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ, both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. If I'm a preacher and up there telling you a sad story, and you're moved by your emotions and you come down and give your life to Jesus, but you don't know about him, your conversion is going to last a week. Exactly. Happens all the time. The Holy Spirit brings this knowledge of the gospel to us. The knowledge involves who Jesus is, that he's the second person of the Godhead, that he's born of the Virgin Mary, that he's clothed in our nature, offered up for our transgressions and raised again for our justification. Who we are, sinners who need a savior and much besides. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the knowledge of the gospel to us. In John 16, Jesus tells us, and when he, that is the Holy Spirit comes, he will convince the world concerning sin 
in righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they don't believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no more concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin because as Jesus immediately explains, they do not believe in me. The primal sin is putting self at the center of life. We are wired to do that. Out of the box. It's all about me. Ambo, it's all about me. I don't know if you know it, but it's all about me. Everybody else is saying, yeah, I don't know about you know it. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. If you go into a room where it's all about you, it can't be about anybody else. But really, what's it really all about? Jesus. What's it all about? Alfie, what's it all about? Now, how does the church, the wider evangelical church, play on that to gain big numbers of crowds? See if you're smart. See how smart you guys all are. I want you to hear that question again. Because how does the wider evangelical church play on the fact that the primal sin is putting self at the center of life? Because God should be at the center of your life. What? God should be at the center of your life. True. But how does the evangelical church play on it and use it to gain a crowd? Feel good messages. Feel good messages that appeal to what though? To self. Self. Self what? Self worth. Self actualization. Self fulfillment. Right? Here's how it works God has a plan for your life. You can't say that to everybody. You say that to a crowd of people, some who are believers and some are not. God has a plan for the unbeliever's life, and they're not going to like it. It's called hell. Hi everyone, thanks for listening. We would like to invite you to become a Mission Partner. Mission Partners are listeners like you who give monthly to make this 100% listener-funded ministry possible. Help us reach New England. May the fallow ground here be plowed by the word of God preached. So join now. How does it help? Well, when you give, you're funding the ministry so that cost is never a barrier to access Pastor David's teaching reaching you. Free online listening and downloads, free mobile app, books and CDs sold at cost. How do you benefit? Well, when you become a mission partner, you'll receive a welcome kit that includes the book, Breaking Good News, God News That You Can Use, written by Pastor David. Learn from a mission partner only, Bible teaching message from Pastor David each month. Request one of our featured book recommendations every six months with no additional donation. All when you give $20 or more monthly. Receive great books like these, Just give us a call or request your books online. It's easy. To get started, first, enter the requested information and set up your automated giving from your checking account or credit card. Second, create an online account by entering the information below or sign in if you already have a Mission Partner account. I'm Jen. Thanks for listening. What's the self-actualization? Preachers saying you come to Jesus, you're going to have a great life. You're going to have a new ministry. Your boring life is going to be over. You're going to be able to do something. You're going to have fun. It's going to be titillating. It's all about you. God's going to help you get what you want. That's not Jesus. That's not the gospel. But it's sold, marketed by the churches of the world. How do you expect they put 45,000 people into a building? Can you imagine this place at 45,000? We'd have to buy Pleasant Street. <laughs> We'd have to knock all the buildings down and build a stadium. But I'd have to sell my soul. Yeah, absolutely. And lose some weight. No. <laughs> now, if 3,000 people were saved in one day, would that be a good day? Yeah. 
3,000 saved. When? The book of Acts, the first sermon of the Christian church preached by who? Peter. 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 On the day of Pentecost, the disciples gathered together to wait the coming of the Holy Spirit. When he came, they went into the streets of Jerusalem, and Peter preached that the coming of the Holy Spirit was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, given to call men and women to Christ and salvation. Then he preached Jesus, saying this, let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. We are told that immediately when they heard this, they were so happy because they had a new ministry and they were going to be doing new stuff. No, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? See what happens? When people really get saved, they don't dance and sing and bark like dogs. They repent in great sorrow. See the diff? It's not about your glory, it's about His. See, this was a remarkable response. 3,000 people repented, but it wasn't because Peter was the best preacher the world has ever seen. Why did it happen then? What happened just before it? Jesus was crucified. What happened after that? The Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came. That's why it happened. Without the Holy Spirit, ain't no one getting saved. Ain't no one. If he preached the sermon the day before, nothing would have happened. No one would have believed. He and the others would have been laughed at. But the Holy Spirit on Pentecost came and convicted the people of their sin. That is why they were cut to the heart and asked, what shall we do? As faith was born in their hearts, repentance followed. They wanted freedom from the sin they suddenly saw in their lives. Beloved, we need the Holy Spirit. We need him desperately. We need him this morning. I have a message to preach to you. You are so far from that message, it hurts. And the only way you get close to it is of the Holy Spirit. And if he doesn't come and do something, then you'll still be the same when you walk out. I'll be different having a little bit less vocal cords and a little... <laughs> but anyway, no spirit, no resurrection. No spirit, no new birth. No spirit, no confession of the Lordship of Jesus. No spirit, no victory over sin. No spirit, no progress in sanctification. No spirit, no spiritual wisdom. No spirit, no spiritual gifts. Amen. So faith is knowledge, right? What else is it? Somebody said it before. It's not a trick question. Chosen. What? Chosen. No, before that. Faith is knowledge, then belief. Believing that the knowledge is true. 
Devils have knowledge. And they know it's true. Because they shudder. But they ain't got the last piece. Love and commitment. While a rational concept of Christianity is needed for faith, we cannot forget that the devil also understands these things and is probably more orthodox than anybody in this room, says James. True biblical faith, therefore, also requires a moving of the heart. Who's that? Much like that described by <clears throat> hint, John Wesley in telling how his heart was strangely warmed as a result of the little meeting in Aldersgate, England. You see, he was a preacher, and he went to Georgia in the United States and preached and preached. But it was, something was wrong. What was it? He wasn't saved. He went back to England, and he got saved. And here's his friend, John Calvin. You think he was just some austere theologian? No, he was no less concerned to distress the heart as well as the intellect. It now remains to pour into the heart itself what the mind is absorbed. For the word of God is not received by faith if it flits about in the top of the brain, but when it takes root in the depth of the heart, that it may be an invincible defense to withstand and drive off all the stratagems of temptation. The Spirit accordingly serves us as a seal to seal up in our hearts those who very promises the certainty of which it was previously impressed upon our minds and takes the place of a guarantee to confirm and establish them. Commitment. Faith is trust and commitment. We turn from trusting in ourselves and instead trust God fully. We see the infinite worth and love of the Son of God who gave himself for our salvation and commit ourselves to him. Therefore, faith is three things. You ready for your Latin lesson? Faith is notitia. Notitia means knowledge. You need to write these down so that you're the smartest kid on the block. You're, and you're, and you're, faith is a census, meaning faith is belief. Faith is knowledge, belief, and faith is fiducia. Faith is trust, commitments. Marriage is a good illustration. These people look familiar? Yes, you. Yeah. You. Wow. <laughs> Why are you laughing, man? Why are you laughing, bro? So listen. Doesn't that like the look of back then? Is? <laughs> 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 that is very beautiful. When I first met the young lady, I didn't walk up to her and say, "Hey." Let's get married or something. Why? I didn't know her. And I didn't know even if I believed in her. But I'd rather sing the song, I'd like to get to know you. Yes, I would. <laughs> so I walked up to her and said, well, hey, can I have your number? So we can get together and... We can get to know you. You get to know me. So we started to get to know each other. Get it? No. Knowledge. Then we were like, we believed in each other. I believe in you. Do we just live together and see him? No. Then came marriage, because that's the real commitment, right? You can't get out of marriage without going through a root canal in a divorce court. <laughs> so they call that commitment, and that's getting married, right? Yes. So you see how faith is like that? You get to know the other person, 
you believe what, what they're saying is true, and then you commit to that person. Did we get married just for a year? Let's try it. Let's just try it for a year and see how it goes. No, they said, until death do you part. And I was like, oh, goodness gracious. That's a long time. I don't know if I can be faithful. I don't know. But I did it. Marriage is a good illustration. That was October 25th, by the way. Those real, those leaves are real. What about Abraham? God said, leave Ur of the Chaldees. And he did. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Where was he going? Correct. Do you know where that was? No. He had no idea. Did he go? Yeah. Yeah. He believed God. And then God said, you're going to have a kid. And they said, yeah, sure. His wife laughed. They were both old. They couldn't do stuff. You know what I mean? They didn't want to do stuff. All they wanted to do was sit around and watch TV and eat and get fat because that kind of went away. And um, they said, no, no, you're going to have a kid. Then they had the kid. It happened. And then he, God says, now I want you to kill the kid. And bring him down over here, this place. Put him on top of the altar. Slit his sternum with a knife. And set him on fire. He did it. He took the kid. The kid thought he was just being help, helping to the point where the kid said, uh, buddy, you're what's for dinner. <laughs> by faith, Abraham, get that, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Try, imagine what it must have been like to get that kid away from his mother. Oh, I'm just going to go out and sacrifice Isaac. I'll be right back. What? i kill you right here, honey. And he who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your descendants be named. He considered that God was able to raise men even from the dead. Hence, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham believed that God was able to perform a resurrection. And he did receive him because God said, no, don't do that. And there was a ram caught in the thicket. Abraham got it and he knew. He got it, the whole thing. What was that a type of? The son of God. The salvation to come, wasn't it? That his own God's son would be the one. God's only son would be the one like that God would say. Yeah. It is. It is. Such is the normal growth of faith. Your faith might be weak right now. Your faith may be strong right now. But the essential fact is that your faith is in God. The Father in his Son the Lord Jesus Christ. God cannot fail. If you grow in your knowledge of God, you will find that your faith will also grow from strength to strength as did the faith of Abraham. And you will be able to sail through the storms that life will throw at you. And it will. Right? Yes. Amen. Right. Amen. It made us stronger. Indeed. Faith. 
Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together, and we pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember these truths that transform. In Jesus' name, amen.